So the rootstock is actually a type of almond tree. From here up is our nectarine. There's a lot of reasons why it's important to know where your food comes from. We really like to encourage life. So this is a mix of a nectarine and a plum. As strange as it sounds, this is the retirement plan. I mean, you know, this, this is the 401k. And we got a clean egg here from one of our chickens. You know, you can do this on a much smaller scale. I mean, you can do this in your backyard. The majority of the manure we pull out and we compost. If you're growing your own food, you are going to be healthier. My name is Dwayne Abair, and I'm a farmer. Good morning. I know, girl. So these, uh, so these guys are probably about seven to eight months old, and we've got a few different types. So we've got these white pigs here. These are Chester's. Uh, we've got. This one here is a Hampshire, and then the two black ones are Berkshires. So we're trying to figure out the best breeds for us to raise. And these guys here, these are actually all sold. So we're raising these for other folks. So we raise them for about, we get them about two months old, and then we raise them for about six or seven months so that they're basically butchering weight. And then we bring them to the processor and uh, yeah, they're for other folks. So uh, it's, it's kind of tough because we get, we get pretty close to them, but as bittersweet as it is, it's the, it's the cycle of life, it's the reality for us. So, you know, we try to integrate all of our animals with the farm itself and the growth on the farm. So what they do while they're in here is they do like any other animal, you know, they're gonna go to the bathroom. And so they'll, urinate here, which is a great nitrogen source for us eventually on the ground. And then the majority of the manure we pull out and we compost. So you'll see this here, this is unfinished compost. So this is just pig manure and wood chips. And then this compost down over the next few months. And then we'll use this to fertilize the 170 or so fruit trees we have here on the farm uh, so far right now. We have oh, 170 fruit trees at current count. When it comes to fruit trees, they're pretty easy. Apples, peaches, pears, plums, pomegranates. Each one of these flowers turns into a pomegranate. Citrus, multiple types of citrus. Mandarins, grapefruit, pomelo, some oranges, lime, lemon. We're trying out some guavas. We're gonna see how those do. This tree, when we planted it, was about the size of this branch. We have mulberries and blackberries that you may not have even heard of before. Got four Shangri-La mulberries, two contorted mulberries. And guess what? They're in the middle of the sun all year long and they thrive in it. This is a specific type of nectarine tree that we have growing here. So the rootstock is actually a type of almond tree and then it's your base and then from here, that graft point where the rootstock is, from here up is our nectarine. So we want the nectarine to grow and make nectarines for us, but what we don't want is we don't want almonds competing for the growth because this rootstock will send out shoots, that's what you see here from the base, and essentially start taking over the nectarine tree, and we don't want that to happen. So when I see these little guys growing from the bottom or from the rootstock, we basically just pull these off. If you let those keep going, eventually this will actually take over this tree, will turn into a random almond tree that probably won't produce fruit for us. This tree is still establishing a canopy, which is where the branching and leaves are at the top here. And you'll see that we have this painted white and everybody always asks us why the white paint. And the, the main reason why we paint these white is we're trying to protect this trunk from sunburn. So we have intense dry sun and it'll actually burn the trunk and potentially kill the tree. So this white 
tree trunk paint that we actually just buy from Home Depot will actually keep the trunk protected until the tree has a big enough canopy and can, and can protect the trunk on its own. So that's the reason why you see this white paint on these trees. A couple years from now, when these are just nice, big, beautiful, massive trees, we won't paint those trunks anymore. So I think it was uh, 2012. We're still living in the city on a 5,500 square foot lot with an 1,800 square foot typical house in a planned community. And we decided, okay, let's start planting fruit trees, you know? And we started a little garden bed for the first time that failed miserably. <laughs> we killed our first apple tree because it was up against a, a, a block wall, you know, not knowing any different. We're like, yeah, let's stick a tree wherever we can. But we got our, our first production of apples the following year. It was just these amazing apples that tasted incredible. You know, I start looking at the space thinking, okay, we've got more space, but you know, what else can we do? So we've got all these fruit trees, that's cool. You know, let's get a garden going. So we start growing vegetables in a little garden bed. Again, not knowing what we're doing, we killed a bunch of stuff. We're still killing trees, but some trees are doing well. We're figuring all this out as we go. So, you know, we've got all these different challenges that, you know, we were having to try to figure out ourselves. So the underground irrigation that we run is a PVC irrigation. It comes from a Wi-Fi controlled um, control panel. You have this water that you drink. Okay, well, where did that water come from? We have a protected aquifer. So we use well water. What's in that water? The water that comes out of this bubbler head and just kind of pours over the bubbler head are the things that are in that water going to help you to be tomorrow? We have the rocks in the center, which we learned from one of our viewers. And so if I can make that tomorrow me better than today, I'm going to do that. And the way that I do that is I farm. So you guys saw the peach trees back there. So we've got basically all of our different types of stone fruit are in this Western orchard. So like this tree here, you can see this is act actually a hybrid and that's not that's not GMO, it's not some type of weird, crazy thing. A hybrid just means it's a mix, a natural mix of two different types of fruit, but both of those are stone fruit. So this is a mix of a nectarine and a plum. So they basically mixed the, those two together when they were pollinating. So they mixed the pollen from one type of tree to the flower of another, and they came up with this hybrid and you can see the leaves on this newly leafing out tree are totally different it's purple and that actually comes from its plum parentage so this is a nectarine and a plum but the purple leaves are from the plum the fruit itself will look something like a mix between a nectarine and a plum so it's pretty cool and then you can see this cage so we attract a lot of life and the first thing that we attracted was rabbits. And when we first planted these trees, we noticed pretty quickly that the rabbits were immediately attacking the trees and basically started munching our trees down to nubs. So what we did is we started using this hardware cloth around the tree to protect the tree and the tree trunk specifically from those rabbits. And since we've had those in, we haven't had any issues with the rabbits getting to our trees. So we can allow the rabbits to come onto the farm because the benefit to rabbits, well, they're putting manure down for us and rabbit manure is fantastic fertilizer for your fruit trees. So we want the rabbits, but we don't want them eating our fruit trees. <laughs> so that's our, that's our compromise with the rabbits that we attract onto the farm. We'll give you something to eat, just uh, leave our fruit trees alone. <laughs> I think this, if this is something that would interest you in, in, in any degree, the biggest thing for you is to realize that there's nothing that I'm doing that you can't do. You know, you can do this on a much smaller scale. I mean, you can do this in your backyard. Don't tell yourself all the reasons why you can't. I can tell you a lot of reasons why you can't. I can tell myself a lot of reasons why I can't. And this is not some, you know, mystical mumbo jumbo. Don't tell yourself you can't do it until you verified you can't do it. So say, hey, can I do this thing? How can I do this thing? And ask yourself those questions instead. So if you wanna do this, ask yourself how. Don't tell yourself how you can't. You can give yourself plenty of reasons. And so if I can do that, you can do that. It's not any different. I'm not smarter. It's not some magical thing. It's none of those things. It's a lot of hard work. This isn't easy. You know, we woke up at three o'clock this morning. We won't go to bed until eight or nine o'clock tonight. We do that every single day, but you know what? 
when I have that cranky, really crappy day and I come bumping down my dirt road that really starts to frustrate me that one day, I come back, I walk outside my back door and I start feeding my pigs and watering my pigs. Guess what? All that stuff goes away. I'm just a city kid from South Central Los Angeles that didn't really know any different and doesn't really know what he's doing still. But at the same time, we're able to produce all these things. And you know, I don't have a college degree. Uh, I don't have a farming back background. I mean, shy of having some fruit trees when I was a kid that I took fruit from, you know, I'm not a farmer. And I say, if we can farm on the edge of nowhere, so can you. So we started incorporating livestock. Um, we started raising laying hens. We started raising broiler chickens. And so we have our laying hens that we let out onto the pasture, but we also keep them protected. You know, instead of just slapping that chicken on your, on a, on a sandwich or grabbing it in the McDonald's drive-through, think about that for a second. We have a rain barrel watering system that we designed. These cups fill with water automatically. So the chickens always have access to fresh water. How is that animal treated? It's gonna become you tomorrow. It's the cells that are gonna divide and become cells tomorrow and in the future. So all we need to do to grab an egg is open this lid here and we got a clean egg here from one of our chickens. I never tasted eggs like that. I've never tasted chicken like that. I didn't know chicken actually tastes like chicken. And we have yet to lose a chicken to our summer heat. And we've been raising chickens now for I believe right at about three years. You take this real thing, you put it inside you and it becomes you. It is closer than anything else on this planet, shy of probably air. But you need to think about these things because they become you, they are you. They're the reason why you do things, you're able to do things. So the question is, is it going to give you the best you tomorrow? Or is the best you yesterday? Come on girls. Go around. So the breed that we use for the our pasture chickens is the same breed that you would find like if you go to the grocery store of course it's going to taste a lot different um, but it's the same breed so they're designed to grow very very rapidly and have a lot of breast meat which is kind of what we're all sort of used to so they grow very very fast they take about eight weeks to go from a little baby chick that we actually have shipped to us in the mail to full size, about a five or six pound chicken, a really, really big chicken in about eight weeks. We keep them in this tractor. These are called chicken tractors. All that simply means it's a mobile pin and we move this every day. So what happens is we have the chickens in there now. They'll eat a lot of food. They will put manure down on the ground. So this looks dead, but you give it a week with some water and this will come back and just be this amazing, strong green color. And then in the end, we have the chickens that we have for ourselves and for our customers. So I think if you were to say, what is your typical farmer? You probably wouldn't describe me. So I'm from Los Angeles. I was born and raised in Gardena. If you know where that's at, it's South Central Los Angeles. So maybe not the nicest uh, neighborhood and it was a little rough, but I always knew when I was a kid, I just didn't fit into the city, even though that's where I was stuck. So um, when I was just out of high school, I moved down to San Diego from Los Angeles. And I was 19 at the time and got diagnosed with stage three lymphoma with Hodgkin's disease. And went through six months of chemotherapy and you know something like that when you're young really changes the way you look at things and kind of shaped how I look at life. But the reality is a hundred years from now, you will not be here. So what's gonna be here when we're gone? We're all here together right now for a reason. If we realize that and we live our lives that way, how different this place would be? Because you would look at how can I take care of myself? And if I'm gonna take care of myself, how can I take care of, you know, eventually my grandkids, great grandkids, great great grandkids, or the people that you care about? What can we do today to make sure that when we're gone, those people have something better than we have today. You won't always be here. This thing that we call life is much bigger than you. It's much, much bigger than you. It's much bigger than the group of us. And if you bring it back down to, I'm gonna eat this thing today. I wanna live till tomorrow. 
I want other people to live till the next day. So when I eat this thing, what am I gonna do with that? What am I gonna do with that time? That's giving me time, it's giving me energy. You know, so what am I gonna do with that? Am I gonna make things better or am I gonna make things worse? Oh,